reinvent an entirely new class of electronic materials, move away from inorganic semiconductors like silicon, gallium arsenide, gallium nitride, and move toward polymer-based uh, materials, polymer semiconductors, or carbon nanotubes, or graphene. We've spent a lot of time exploring that route to biocompatible electronics, and there are a lot of groups doing great work in that space, and I think it's still a very rich area for academic discovery. But the other way to think about it would be, let's stick with the known materials that, that already serve as the underpinnings for commercialized devices, but instead of deploying those materials in macro scale forms like semiconductor wafers, think about what nanotechnology and uh, nanoscale forms of material could bring um, you know, to bear uh, in, in terms of alternative uh, form factors. And so one approach that's worked really well for us is to use uh, nanoscale material elements of um, you know, uh, substances like, like silicon that are already uh, well, well known in, in wafer-based form, but whose uh, mechanics changes in an important way as the dimensions uh, are reduced. And so this is sort of just elementary uh, bending mechanics, but it turns out to be uh, sort of important. So the uh, bending stiffness of material is defined not only by the intrinsic mechanical properties of that material, the Young's modules, but it also depends on, let's say, the cube of the thickness for a slab or a sheet of material. And so in going from a wafer where the thickness might be you know, in the range of uh, a millimeter or so to uh, sheets of the same material that have thicknesses, you know, uh, some orders of magnitude smaller, maybe 10 uh, nanometers or, or 100 nanometers, you end up with uh, many orders of magnitude reduction in bending stiffness because of that cubic dependence. So if you think about silicon nanomembranes, they're very, very flexible. You can bend them to very tight radius of curvature because the peak strains associated with bending scale down linearly with the thickness. So you end up with a very flexible, floppy piece of material. Now it's not a one-to-one -one replacement for the wafer, but you can think about this kind of construct as a building block material that you can integrate with a substrate that would give you the mechanics that you ultimately want. So a sheet of plastic or uh, a slab of uh, rubber, for example. And so in order to do that, you have to think about how do I heterogeneously integrate an inorganic low CTE material like silicon with a polymer-based you know, substrate like, like polyimid. Um, you know, much different in terms of mechanical properties and coefficients of thermal uh, expansion. And if you think about just gluing a silicon wafer chip onto a piece of plastic, you realize that that is an adhesive interface that's very hard to manage from a practical standpoint. How do you get strong enough adhesion to maintain bonding? And there, um, you know, the thickness reduction comes to your rescue again in terms of a scaling parameter. So the energy release rate parameter G, which defines the pr uh, propensity of a crack to form between two dissimilar materials, it decreases uh, linearly with thickness. So as you go from a silicon wafer uh, scale piece of material to one of these nano membranes, it becomes easier and easier to establish a robust bond to a dissimilar material like a plastic or, or a rubber. And so this is just an example of that. This is a, a piece of silicon uh, adhered just by Van der Waals forces to a micro-machined ridge on an underlying plastic substrate. And uh, you can sort of maintain the structure in that cantilever geometry, partly because of that linear redu uh, reduction in the energy release rate associated with fracture at that interface with uh, thickness, the, the linear, linear uh, decrease with, with thickness. So those are two really, really basic uh, ideas uh, in mechanics that, that make uh, nanoscale forms of materials like silicon or gallium arsenide, the same considerations would, would, would apply, uh, begin to make those, those classes of materials uh, interesting in this broader context of biointegration. So then the next question is, if, if that's what you want to do from a mechanics standpoint, how do you create the material elements in the first place? And one way would be to develop new growth techniques for, for silicon. And there's been a lot of work, obviously, in silicon nanowires and so on. And um, that's certainly a promising way to, to think about you know, forming these elements. But then at the same time, you have to recognize that uh, the silicon wafer itself is a commodity piece of materials technology, very, very sophisticated, but low in cost because it's been driven to that low cost point by this you know, huge uh, industry of uh, consumer gadgetry. And so if you could think about using that uh, material structure as a starting point, that might be an alternative way to think, of, you know, cre think about creating these nanostructures. So it turns out there are anisotropic etching tricks that allow you to take a wafer and then shave off very, very thin nanoscale ribbons of device-grade monocrystal and silicon from the near surface region of that wafer. And you can do this mul multiple times. This is KOH, uh, KOH etching. Uh, of a silicon wafer with a 111 orientation. So you can kind of do this. We stopped the etch in, uh, in this case just before it completely undercut the ribbon, but, the, but this turns out to be a, a very uh, nice way to create high quality you know, pieces of material with these nanoscale forms.
And there are ways you can get uh, tricky about this. You can sculpt the sidewalls. You can evaporate using uh, directional flux uh, metal as a as a resist layer on the on the sidewalls, leaving just certain regions of the uh, silicon exposed. You dunk that into uh, KOH or, or Tema etchant. You can create you know bulk quantities of silicon nano uh, ribbons just in a single process uh, sequence. So that that works pretty well. There are other kinds of approaches you can apply to compound semiconductors. It's not just silicon. There are anisotropic etching tricks that you can use with gallium arsenide. Uh, for, for example, to pinch off the near surface region, in this case, triangular cross section gallium arsenide wires. Again, you know, the bending mechanics being defined by those characteristic uh, uh, dimensions, which here are sub, sub micron in, in terms of uh, scale. So, silicon, gallium arsenide, similar ideas. You can do indium phosphide, gallium nitride. You can create a whole portfolio of semiconductor nanomaterials, starting with wafer based forms of these materials, and uh, it turns out to be a very straightforward uh, method that doesn't require uh, reinvention of uh, gro growth techniques um, you know, to, to, to create these elements. So then the third question is how are you going to move these materials around so that you can integrate them in a deterministic way into a, a, a real working system? And there's been a lot of work on uh, sort of self-assembly approaches, fluidic guided, uh, you know, shape complementarity in, in substrates and you get sedimentation, all kinds of different ways to think about how to organize wires. Um, you know, I think you have to really consider, you know, in a, in a serious way, throughputs and yields and, um, and uh, orientation control, positional control. And so uh, we've taken a, a different strategy, which is one that's inspired by the ideas of uh, soft lithography, where you're not printing molecules, you're printing semiconductor nanostructures. And because they're generated from a wafer using a lithographic process, you know exactly where those membranes or uh, ribbons are located. Initially, you can take a stamp and then use that uh, pre-processed wafer, almost like an inking pad. Bring the stamp into contact, you lift it off, you end up with uh, inked regions uh, of, of the raised features of relief on the stamp, and then you just index the stamp over target substrate, and then you can deliver these uh, material elements down in a very highly controlled, high throughput manner. So you can print you know, hundreds of thousands of individual nano ribbons or membranes in a single pr print cycle, and then you can step and repeat and move material from a relatively small area defined by the wafer size to uh, very large areas uh, you know, across the substrate uh, of interest. And the key here is uh, control of the mechanics of soft adhesion, because as you can imagine, you want a very strong adhesive force to allow you to lift these uh, elements from the wafer at very high yields, but you don't want the adhesion to be so strong you can't get them back off the surface of the stamp. So there's a whole set of research concepts that we built out over the years that allow you to switch that adhesion from strong to weak to allow this process to happen at very high yields. And I won't go through that sort of outside of the scope of the talk today, but you can build tools around that. And these are used in high volume manufacturing and uh, micro scale uh, LED uh, displays by Acceloprint and uh, X-Display and, uh, and others. This is basically an automated system. You have a vision. Uh, camera that allows you to do uh, registration and overlay and, uh, and stages allow you to move, move the uh, substrate around and do this printing in an automated fashion. But you say you can take all those ideas, this mechanics, materials, manufacturing, and then bring them together to allow for the construction of very high performance flexible electronics. This is an example of very tiny micro scale uh, LEDs, uh, Al Ngap. Uh, LEDs, 1,600 of them, 100% yields, about 200 microns on a side, 200 nanometers in thickness, printed onto a sheet of PET and then subsequently wrapped around a cylindrical support to just give you a sense of the bending mechanics, which really relies on the principles I uh, described before. Allen gap is a very uh, brittle material, uh, yet in these very thin, small forms, uh, you know, they can be bent you know, uh, to this kind of radius of curvature, and they don't pop off the surface because of that linear downscaling of energy release rate with thickness. So that's kind of an illustration of all of the ideas sort of put together uh, in, in a way that kind of vi visually uh, illustrates those concepts. So if this is uh, a capability, now you can imagine building electrodes and interconnects and dielectric layers and starting with these high performance uh, electronic materials on a flexible substrate, you can now build out uh, you know, biocompatible but still very high performance uh, materials that are leveraging you know, all the progress that's been made around uh, conventional electronics but adapting those materials and, and ideas in, in a direction that allows you to achieve uh, qualitatively differentiated mechanics. And so you can do this kind of thing. So you can build skin-like devices that can interface directly with the epidermis. You can exploit that skin interface for measurement of clinical grade quantities around physiological health. And you can do it continuously and wirelessly. 
So you can do ECG, for example, going far beyond what's possible with a conventional wrist-mounted wearable. That's the idea. It's like skin-like device exploiting that skin interface to reproduce kinds of measurements that are done in a hospital, but in the real world continuously. So we sort of felt like we had figured this out in 2011, got a lot better at it in 2014. And from that point on, really focused on how do we take all these ideas in material science and mechanics and biointegration and so on to do useful things. And uh, one of those things is the development of purely wireless ways to do full vital signs monitoring of probably the most fragile patients that you will encounter in any kind of hospital complex, the premature babies. And so they're typically monitored by wired-based systems that have to uh, be adhered to the surface of the skin with tapes that can sometimes cause skin injuries upon uh, removal because the skin is highly underdeveloped in these babies. And being able in the future to get rid of the tapes, the uh, you know, surface interfaced uh, wired based electrodes and replace them with sort of skin like devices operating wirelessly is something that uh, you know, we're very interested in. And I won't go through the details. We just published this a few, few months ago, but this is full deployment of all those kind of ideas in probably the most uh, demanding area of, uh, of the hospital, the neonatal intensive care unit. And so we're deep into that, into that process. We're in the uh, neonatal ICU, but also the pediatric ICU at this point. So we've uh, broadened beyond neonates into pediatric population. These are slightly larger babies, but they still require 24 uh, seven monitoring of, of all vital signs. And you can reproduce those measurements uh, with full clinical grade quality now with skin-like devices, one on the chest and one on the foot and they're operated in a battery-free wireless uh, manner. Wireless energy harvesting coming from an antenna that's transmitting in the base of the chair, in this case, up to the uh, devices. The same magnetic inductive li uh, link is allowing for data flow back, back out. So this is a major program for us. Um, going beyond just publishing papers, we actually have substantial funding now from the Gates Foundation, the Save the Children Foundation, to deploy these devices into the developing world where there are no monitoring uh, technologies at all, wired or otherwise. And so we just launched into Zambia and Kenya this month. So we put 1,000 devices uh, in, into both of those lo locations. Zambia is mostly focused around maternal health. Kenya is neonatal. Uh, and we'll be going into India and Pakistan uh, as well over the next uh, 12, 12 months. So we're doing do uh, 10,000 units into, that, uh, into that, um, you know, the, that set of uh, countries. And I'll be in Zambia myself uh, in, in December. Uh, to see see how things are going. So this is the team, just to give you a sense. We sort of sort of put it all together, building thousands of devices. We have the full software interface and so on. So that's kind of what's uh, what's going on in terms of skin interface devices. Let me sort of transition to this idea of transient electronics. Supposed to be the main uh, point of the talk. Before I do that, I would just say that the same concepts I just outlined to you for skin-like electronics, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, the broader motivation is biointegration, not just skin integration. And so we're looking at brain and cardiac and spinal cord, peripheral nerves and bladder uh, are active areas for, for the group. The same concepts apply. So you can put electronics on the surface of the brain uh, in ways that are fully conformal to the textures of the brain, uh, and you can establish long-term interfaces then, electrical interfaces of the brain for stimulation and monitoring of brain processes. You can do the same thing, in this case, in a uh, 3D matching form to the full epicardial surface. So you can wrap electronics uh, around the outside surface of the heart, almost like an instrumented pericardium, and that, that turns out to be pretty interesting as well. Our uh, initial work in brain interfaces is motivated by the need for a high-resolution diagnostic for measuring electrical activity in the context of a surgical procedure used to treat acute forms of epilepsy, which involves two steps. One is observing the patterns of electrical activity while a seizure is happening. A trained surgeon takes a look at that spatiotemporal representation of the electrical activity, identifies the um, the site of the uh, brain that's causing that abnormality, and then they come in and they resect it. And the idea was to uh, create a surgical diagnostic tool in that context that would allow you to map out that spatiotemporal distribution of electrical activity at resolution that's much higher than what's possible today with just passive arrays of electrodes. So full integrated electronics as a diagnostic. And in that case, you need an interface to the brain that is stable over a time scale of a few days, typically. And so the device is just placed there a few days, then it's removed, and that's it. So you can think about all kinds of surgical tools where the residence time, the tissue interface, really needs to be stable only for a relatively short 
short period of time. At the other end of the spectrum in terms of application opportunities would be a replacement for a pacemaker, just looking out into the future, 10, 20 years into the future, going beyond just a point contact electrode interface for pacing the heart to something that would allow for spatiotemporal control of pacing voltages across the whole surface of the heart. Uh, allowing you to do more sophisticated manipulations and maybe provide sensing capabilities as well. You could detect maybe the early onset of an arrhythmia and then stimulate the heart in a way that would eliminate that condition. That kind of be the vision in the, into the future. But if you're thinking about that as a possibility, now you have to think about residence times that would be comparable to the life of the patient. So now instead of a few days or a week, you're talking about a few decades, maybe 50 years, 100 years. And that creates a whole separate set of challenges around how you create material systems that are stable for that type of time scale when you're completely immersed in warm salt water, essentially, right? The surrounding biofluids. Uh, and so there, there are a lot of interesting material science questions. We're interested in both of those applications. What we didn't realize back in 2011, 20, 2012 or so is that there are a set of opportunities in the middle of those two length scales, uh, time scales. Devices that you would put into the body and they would survive maybe for a few weeks uh, where their operational lifetime is correlated and time to match a natural biological process. So you can think about it in the context of like a resorbable suture. So you suture up your skin and a lot of times that, that suture thread is resorbable. So it will just naturally disappear as the wound is healed. So you don't need to take the suture threads back out after they're no longer needed. Can you think about that type of concept in the, in the context of active electronics? You might go inside the body for an internal wound and you could monitor the wound healing process, maybe deliver therapies, drugs, electrical stimulation to accelerate the rate of regeneration. And then after the healing is completed, the device would just naturally dissolve and disappear in, into the body. And so that was kind of the concept. So um, you know, this is the definition that, that we uh, have used for this space is transient, physically transient electronics is defined by those that fully or partly dissolve or resorb or otherwise physically disappear at some kind of programmed rate or a triggered time. And you can imagine there would be applications going beyond biomedical devices, which I just re, uh, described to you, not only in the context of wound healing, but maybe chemotherapy, other kinds of um, you know, applications that, that have only a, a certain time window associated with them, so temporary diagnostic implants. But you can think about even these same ideas in the context of consumer electronics, where the transients, in this case, if you could think about sort of environmentally degradable materials, that might be an, an interesting thing con to consider for products like RFID tags, where it's huge numbers of tags. You don't need them for long periods of time, just sort of point of sale, and, and maybe you could create those out of resorbable materials to eliminate you know, or reduce electronic waste streams uh, in, that, in that case. Or environmental monitors or sensors you deploy. We were funded by DARPA for a while and hardware secure electronics, non-recoverable systems that could be triggered to disappear if they were uh, at risk for recovery by an adversary or hardware reconfigurable systems uh, as well. So th those are the kinds of opportunities. I'll just talk about our interest here because that's the main motivation for our work in this area. But you can think about it a little bit more broadly. So as for these uh, biocompatible electronic systems, the big question is what are you going to use for the materials? Here you have to think not only about mechanics, but also about bioresorbability. And you may, again, sort of naively be drawn towards polymers or maybe carbon nanotubes or small molecules. The polymers uh, may be attractive, and they are attractive in principle because there's a tremendous amount of chemical versatility in the, uh, in the way that, that, you, that you think about the pol polymer uh, chemistries. But uh, where, where you might be able to conceivably create a material that not only is excellent uh, in terms of electronic properties, but also has the ability to undergo hydrolysis, for example, when exposed to uh, water. And there's a lot of work thinking about polymers in the context of transient electronics. But as before, if you, if you could figure out a way to use silicon for these kinds of uh, applications, that's what you would do because it's uh, sort of the workhorse material. A lot is already understood about silicon and, and how to manufacture with it and build high quality devices. But you would naively think, uh, again, as, as maybe you would for flexible devices, that silicon is not going to be relevant for transient electronics because you know, for people doing electronics, you, know, you think about silicon mostly in, in the context of a silicon uh, wafer. And uh, I think in terms of chemical stability, most people you know, consider silicon as sort of a rock. You, know, you put it in a, a bucket of water, not, nothing much is going to happen. And it turns out that that is true, but, but only to some degree. 
It turns out that uh, silicon is in fact water soluble just at super low rates that you typically uh, can ignore you know, at the scale of a bulk piece of material like, like a silicon wafer. But if you're playing around with these very thin silicon nano ribbons and nano membranes like we were in the context of these flexible bio-integrated bio uh, systems, uh, those very slow rates of dissolution in water become uh, very meaningful. So you can take uh, a very uh, small platelet, in this case it's uh, AFM image Z height uh, is exaggerated, it's about 100 nanometers in thickness, a couple of microns on the side. If you immerse that in a uh, buffered solution, saline solution, at physiological pH, which is slightly basic, physiological temperature, uh, you can just watch it disappear. It, it actually dissolves very slowly, a few nanometers per day, uh, based on a surface erosion process, but, but it's completely gone you know, in, in just three weeks. And the chemistry is very similar to the chemistry associated with silicon micro-machining from the MIMS uh, community, but, but occurring at a near neutral pH value. So it's very, very slow compared to silicon etching, but it's essentially the same uh, chemistry. It's silicon reacting with water to form silicic acid and a little bit of uh, hydrogen. And so this was very, very interesting to us because uh, you know, we kind of stumbled across it, didn't really think about silicon as a, a possible candidate uh, for transient electronics, but th this is, uh, uh, was a great thing. Uh, partly because silicon is already uh, very well developed as an electronic material, semiconductor material, but also because silicic acid is naturally occurring in uh, biofluids. Silicon is a recommended uh, part of a daily diet. It's occurring in groundwater, and so it's biocompatible. The end product is uh, biocompatible, and you only need a tiny amount of silicon in order to build active uh, you know, devices, just microgram uh, quantities. So this is uh, some uh, uh, MD simulations of that chemistry. So this is a silicon crystal here immersed in water, you can see here at neutral pH. And that particular silicon atom is tagged because during the course of this movie, it will react with water and dissociate from the underlying crystal in the form of silicic acid. So you can imagine if you continue this simulation, you'd eventually consume that uh, nanocrystal of uh, silicon. So it was just sort of a study of the underlying chemistry. And I won't go into the details. We've published uh, several papers on, on the chemistry of silicon uh, dissolution and hydrolysis. But that, that's kind of uh, the essence of it. So if you think about silicon for transient electronics, the key is it's very, very thin so that uh, it can dissolve on a reasonable time scale. So 35 nanometer thick layer of silicon, which is used as the top device layer in silicon on insulator uh, electronics, uh, consumer electronics. If you think about that, for transient electronics, it will dissolve at ten, in 10 days of immersion in uh, you know, sort of simulated biofluids, and you only need about a half a milliliter of water to consume a one square centimeter area of 35 nanometer thick silicon without exceeding the solubility limits associated with the silicic acid. So that's kind of how it works. The uh, silicon wafer, just by point of comparison, is nearly a millimeter thick. It requires nearly a thousand years to dissolve. And for a one centimeter squared chip of silicon, you need eight liters of water. So this is conventional. This is transient. This is something you could imagine eating or putting in your body. This probably you don't want to do that. Um, so that's the semiconductor. And then uh, we kind of went nuts, you know, early 2013, 2014 building out a complete toolbox of materials that you could add to silicon to begin to build devices that are entirely transient. So, so silicon is great, but uh, various forms of silicon, not just monocrystalline, but amorphous, uh, nanoporous, germanium, silicon, germanium, zinc oxide, they're all water soluble. Uh, semiconductors you can think about, uh, SiO2, silicon nitride, these are great dielectrics. They also dissolve. Uh, silicic acid is the uh, uh, reaction product for uh, SiO2, silicic acid and uh, ammonia for silicon nitride. And so this is great because these materials are already used commercially in standard devices. But you can think of other things, magnesium oxide, spin on glasses. There are a number of different metals you can think about uh, for electrodes, interconnects, wiring and so on. We do a lot with magnesium and zinc, but tungsten, molybdenum, iron and paste of these materials as well. And then what are you going to build your devices on? Well, there's a whole range of uh, known biodegradable polymers that, that you can think about for that purpose. And you can uh, use these materials as well uh, for encapsulation. So here's an example of a paste uh, built with uh, tungsten and wax. So you can uh, build not only evaporated uh, layers of metal that you can uh, pattern uh, using photolithography, but you can also screen print thick conductive uh, materials by using these kinds of uh, these kinds of pastes. Anyway, a lot, lot of different materials ideas can be brought to bear to this area. It's very, very straight, straightforward. So there's a, a, there's a lot of versatility. The, the key is that you can build high quality devices, devices with performance that is comparable to a conventional wafer-based system, but 
constructed with purely bioresorbable materials. This is an example of an array of transistors. That's the kind of mobility, very good switching characteristics. You can build logic gates by putting multiple transistors together. All of that works. You can build strain gauges and so on, again, using piezoresistive effects in silicon. And I'll come back to this uh, in a little bit. Uh, and describe how we exploit that kind of sensing modality in the context of traumatic brain injury. You can also do photodetectors, solar cells, different, different things. You can put it all together and build simple circuits. So this is a RF oscillator. It includes an inductor, capacitor, high-speed transistor, RF diode, and a resistor, where the constituent materials are silicon, ultra-thin silicon, silicon nanomembrane, silicon dioxide, magnesium, magnesium oxide, and here it's silk fibrin is what we're using as the substrate. So it's a cold pits oscillator. It operates like you would expect an oscillator to operate with this particular type of design. But the key unique defining feature is that all of the materials are water soluble to biocompatible end products. And that, that's kind of the key uh, goal here. So this is a movie that we created when we were still funded by DARPA in the early days. It was just an example of a device that would naturally dissolve away in rain wa uh, water. Uh, and so this, this device was designed to melt away almost immediately in, uh, upon contact with water. But you can choose the materials and the overall architectures to achieve operating lifetimes matched to uh, an application of interest. And I'll come back to that in a little bit. But I mentioned uh, you know, the biocompatibility. This is so, sort of an interesting um, you know, po point of reference. If you think about this particular circuit, I just showed, showed uh, this to you. It's mostly silk, which is already known to be biocompatible. It's edible. There's no, no toxicity at all. Uh, and then very, very thin films of the active materials, magnesium and silicon mostly. But because it's very thin films, the total mass quantity of these elements is very small, 100 micrograms for magnesium, 3 micrograms for silicon. What does that mean in terms of uh, you know, compatibility with, with body processes? Well, I told you that uh, silicon, and I'll mention it now, magnesium is also part of a recommended daily diet. So if you take a look at a one-a-day multivitamin tablet and you look at the magnesium and silicon content, uh, contents, th 300 milligrams magnesium, 10 milligrams of silicon. So orders of magnitude more magnesium in, in, in a vitamin pill than uh, in this device. So you can think about this as a piece of transient electronics or like a really lousy vitamin tablet because you have to like eat a thousand of those in order to uh, be, be relevant. But we also do a lot of histology, a lot of animal studies to watch how these materials disappear uh, in the body over time. These are uh, CT scans of a rat-based model where we've uh, inserted just a, a basic test platform and then we can just watch it dis disappear in this case over the course of uh, 45, uh, 45 days. And we can do blood uh, uh, chemistry analysis and other, other kinds of uh, studies. We haven't seen any adverse effects of these devices. So with the last bit of my talk, I'm going to focus on clinical use cases that, that might be unique, uniquely enabled by these kinds of devices. And in every example, it's not something that we've thought up. It's opportunities that have been brought to us by the clinical community. And I'll start with one in the uh, treatment of uh, severe traumatic brain injury. So this was an idea that was uh, brought to us uh, a few years ago by uh, neurosurgeons at Washington University's medical school. And these are experts uh, who, who treat severe traumatic brain injury. So these are brain injuries that you know, cause you to go to the hospital immediately. You go into the uh, operating room. There's a surgical procedure associated with the wound. And then during the recovery period, it's very uh, important to monitor continuously the intracranial pressure and temperature because both of those parameters uh, you are very important to the uh, recovery trajectory. And if the pressure exceeds a certain value, it could lead to permanent brain, da uh, brain damage. And the way that that monitoring is done currently is with a sensor that's uh, wired to external data acquisition electronics that goes into the intracranial uh, space and measures those quantities continuously. But you don't need the sensor there forever. You just need it during that critical recovery period. Once the patient has recovered beyond a certain uh, level, you don't need the sensors anymore, and then they have to be removed surgically. So the non-degradable requires a secondary surgery then for extraction because they're only needed in a temporary sense. Uh, they are wired in their operation, so it restricts the movement of the patient, which is important in the context of uh, rehabilitation and recovery, and requires an external interface. So there's a suture site that can become a, a nidus for infection. So the vision that was brought to us by uh, the neurosurgeons was essentially that if you could really make bioresorbable transient devices, we get rid of the wires. Uh, we would eliminate the need to do the secondary surgery, uh, and we could fully suture the uh, surgical site uh, to, to eliminate, eliminate some of these risks. 
So we spent a lot of time on this. Uh, it's actually, uh, you know, we built out a, a micro uh, uh, electromechanical systems technology, a MIMS technology, transient. But, but the pressure sensing was, was the most difficult, and it really relies on those uh, silicon-based strain gauges I mentioned to you before, changes in resistance with strain, and you can measure that. You put a strain gauge right at the edge of a drumhead membrane, PLGA, it's a bioresorbable polymer, uh, that's sitting over a cavity that's etched into an underlying substrate, in this case, a nanoporous silicon. So as the pressure of the surrounding cerebrospinal fluid changes, it deflects that membrane, and then you can pick up the extent of deflection electrically, by measuring the resistance through that uh, strain gauge. It's the serpentine structure of a uh, silicon nanomembrane. So that, that's the way it works. It scales down in dimensions very nicely. You can make these very, very tiny. They can insert into the intracranial space, use modeling to connect the measured change in resistance to deflection and therefore pressure. That's, that's the way it works. This is a time-lapse image of one of those devices uh, at different stages of dissolution. You can see the silicon is partly transparent. It's a indirect uh, band gap material. It's very thin, so it's essentially transparent. That's the strain gauge. This is the uh, substrate. There's the drumhead membrane. There's the P PLGA. You can see the outline uh, there. But these work pretty well, uh, so you can uh, benchmark their performance against commercial ICP sensors across a physiologically relevant range of pressure from about zero to 80 or so millimeters of mercury. Uh, and it's just a time transient to show sort of equivalency between the transient biodegradable sensor and the commercial sensor. Of course, in the transient sensor, you're measuring resistance. So you have to connect resistance to pressure. But these are operating in a linear response regime, so it's just a single calibration factor that allows you to go, go between the two. So it can uh, pick up dynamic changes in, um, in pressure and offers stable operation up to about four or five days. I'll come back to that in a second. At that point, the, pro the, the, uh, the characteristics of the pressure transistor start to drift because the device is partially dissolving away. Uh, and so that, that becomes uh, the essential challenge in any of these transient electronic devices is how do you achieve very stable operation in a construct that's made out of materials that are all entirely water soluble. That, that's the, the challenge and it's kind of an interesting material science uh, question to think about. But these are uh, uh, devices that we've tested extensively in rats and so you can measure pressure transients uh, the uh, uh, commercial devices, the uh, blue dots, and then the transient sensor here. It's fully wireless. We have a subdermal radio. It's mostly transient, not fully transient, uh, but mostly. And it's just superficial under the skin. And then there's a, a resorbable wire that connects to the uh, pressure and temperature sensor that sits in the intracranial space. It's kind of the way it works. And so it's fully sutured up like that. Uh, and you can see changes in temperature here, uh, again, commercial and transient. So that works pretty well. The challenge, as I just mentioned, is achieving stable operation over the full time period of interest. So four or five days is at the front end. You'd like to be able to run two weeks, three weeks, depending on the uh, trajectory of the uh, recovery of the individual patient. And what we found is that the polymer materials are tough uh, in the sense that they tend to swell slightly over time. Water permeates into them. They start to slowly uh, dissolve. And it's not just from a surface erosion process. There's a whole reactive diffusion component as well. Water's coming into the materials, dissolving it from the inside out uh, in addition to from the surfaces. And so in order to get a more stable device, we moved to a purely inorganic system where we use very thin layers of uh, thermally grown SiO2 as the encapsulation. As I mentioned, SiO2 is transient, but it's transient into surface erosion process that's very uh, well uh, controlled and can be uh, predicted to some degree. So we're still using the overall construct uh, that I showed you before, but we're getting rid of the PLGA and replacing that with this very thin SiO2 silica encapsulation. And so with that type of strategy, you end up with stable operation over about 25 days with almost no drift you can see here. So these uh, blue dots, those are commercial sensor uh, readings, and the red trace is uh, with the transient uh, device. So we're doing wireless readout. We have transient pressure and transient temperature as well. So that's one, one way to solve the materials problem is move to an inorganic uh, platform uh, and away from polymers. So polymers might be good if it's just a really tricky uh, set of requirements to satisfy with that type of material. But anyway, we can do CT scans, uh, uh, MRI imaging, and we can watch these uh, sensors disappear over time. We can also track uh, the elemental uh, uh, content in uh, various organ systems to see how these materials are uh, ultimately expelled from the body. So they ultimately are filtered out in the kidneys or in, uh, and are discharged by urination. But you can see that through this uh, time frame of uh, you know, one, one, to, one to five uh, weeks.
So my battery is dead, dead here, so <laughs> go to this. Uh, so you can do uh, pressure. You can also do electrical uh, recordings uh, as well. This is an example of surface um, uh, electrical measurements, electrocorticography, uh, up to about thir 30 days or so with, with stable operation. And you can do not only uh, single point measurements, but you can come back to this idea of active electronics for high resolution spatial and temporal mapping of electrical activity. And so you can do all of that in a, in a transient uh, form. And you can see the uh, patterns of electrical activity, in this case associated with a seizure that was uh, pharmacologically induced in a rat-based model, uh, but with a transient monitoring system. And so being able to measure electrical activity, again, in the context of this recovery process, uh, can, can provide an important complement to just measuring the pressure uh, and the temperature. But let me uh, take, take uh, you know, things in a slightly different direction. So you can do all kinds of measurements and sensing, but ultimately I think the, the biggest impact will be in the delivery of therapy together with sensing and maybe doing both in a closed uh, feedback loop manner. I won't force you to look at that for a long period of time. So, so what, what turns out to be the case, and again, this is a use case that was brought to us by a different group of neurosurgeons, again at Wa Washington University, is that uh, if you suffer uh, a severe damage to a peripheral nerve, you will go into uh, an operating room. The surgeons will uh, open you up and then typically suture uh, back the, uh, the point at which you've suffered uh, an injury. It could be a transection, it could be a crush injury. They do that suture process. And then what they will also do in the OR context is that they will electrically stimulate the nerve at a proximal site. So upstream from the uh, location of the injury. And the uh, biological basis for this is not fully understood, but it is known that if you do electrical stimulation for about 30 minutes to an hour in the OR, uh, and then close up the patient, that their rate of recovery will exceed that of patients who have not received the electrical stimulation. And so this is a, sort of a therapy that, that's used in the OR. The problem uh, with it, or that it's the opportunity for transient electronics, is you would be able to do this electrical stimulation not just in the OR, but at different time points during the recovery process. Because with an implantable uh, wireless stimulator, you don't need direct physical access to the, to the nerve. So the vision was this, and it really represents kind of an engineered form of electronic medicine in a sense where you would go into the operating room, maybe you do your uh, intraoperative stimulation, but then at the very tail end of the surgery, you leave behind a wireless stimulator device made out of transient materials so that you can suture the surgical site closed and then wirelessly deliver stimulation at various dose profiles throughout the healing process to further uh, yield further benefits in accelerated neuro neuroregeneration beyond what's possible just with electrical stimulation confined to the intraoperative period. So that was the, uh, that was the vision. And from an engineering standpoint, you know, at that point, at that stage, we had all the you know, capabilities to, to build, the, build the hardware. So this is a fully uh, transient, wirelessly powered and wirelessly controlled nerve stimulator, so it consists of a cuff, a wireless uh, harvesting unit, so there's a, uh, an RF diode to do the rectification, and then uh, all, all of the other materials as well are uh, bio bioresorbable. So these are some of the uh, electromagnetic characteristics of the devices. I won't say too much about that. Uh, if you're interested, I'm happy to have the conversation afterwards. But this is what the devices look like, so they're very thin, they're flexible, they offer uh, you know, a non-invasive uh, cuff interface to the nerve, and then this power harvesting and control unit uh, back, at the, uh, back at the other side of the, of the system. So this is a result of a tremendous number of rat uh, studies where uh, we've uh, artificially, well, our collaborators have artificially damaged the sciatic nerve in this case, either transection or cuff, uh, and then um, leave, they, they leave these wireless stimulators uh, behind, and then you measure the extent of healing uh, by quantifying the EMG amplitude associated with muscle activity uh, stimulated uh, electrically as a function of time in weeks for three different cases. And you can imagine there's a, a, an enormous uh, phase space here to, to explore in terms of uh, you know, stimulation waveforms, stimulation voltages, currents, durations, and so on. But this is just an uh, example of what, what you could do. One day electrical stimulation, that just corresponds to the intraoperative procedure that's used currently. And you can see the uh, recovery trajectory illustrated there with the uh, black uh, symbols. And then extend it out to electrical stimulation uh, once a day for three days, uh, and then once a day 
uh, for six days, uh, unique, the, again, uniquely enabled by, by the transient uh, implant. And you can see that the additional stimulation not only accelerates the rate of recovery, the slope, but it improves the uh, endpoint of, of the recovery uh, as well, because that, that terminal uh, point uh, you know, in, increases in terms of uh, EMG amplitude as you extend out the, uh, the stimulation. This is what it looks like, uh, you know, at a couple of different stages, uh, you know, dur during the healing process, zero weeks, eight, and then 21 weeks, the device is completely gone. There's no uh, evidence of any uh, residue le left over, um, either at the, at the point of the nerve interface, the cuff, or the uh, back end uh, wireless harvester uh, either. So that's kind of one example. Uh, you might say, okay, well, you can do peripheral nerves, but then like what else? It turns out, um, you know, there are a lot of uh, application opportunities enabled by a transient electrical stimulator. And this just highlights a number of different areas that we're, that we're working on. Uh, I'll highlight uh, uh, a couple of different examples. This is spinal cord muscle stimulator. It's easy to do, do the engineering and adapt the devices to different interface points across the body. This is a, an example of a, an application that was brought to us by um, cardiologists at, at Northwestern. And evidently, there are opportunities for um, transient pacemaking uh, following uh, an open heart surgical process. So, uh, you know, you have a patient at, at risk, they have to have an open heart uh, surgery. Uh, and typically, they will uh, leave in a pacing lead that can be activated during the uh, recovery process to the extent that that might be necessary, depending on the uh, patient's condition. And I'll highlight the problems with that kind of um, you know, traditional uh, temporary pacemaker, but they came to us and asked us if we could build a transient pacemaker for that kind of post-surgical recovery uh, application. And it turns out to be really, really easy to do that. The, the, the problem with the um, non-transient pacemaker is you can get the lead in. There's no problem uh, with doing that. But over the course of uh, several weeks, it becomes uh, enveloped uh, in, in uh, scar tissue, essentially. Uh, you end up with this fibrotic shell around the pacing lead so that extraction becomes difficult uh, without you know, da uh, inducing additional damage to the, uh, to the epicardial surface or depending on where the, where the, the lead is, is located. And so it's, it's a big uh, practical problem, I am told, by, by our collaborators that uh, would go away you know, if, you, if you were able to transition to a fully transient wireless-based um, device. And so we've been able to put that together. So it's the same type of concepts in wireless uh, control and power transfer. It's just you know, the form factor is, is a little bit different. And um, you know, we've been, been able to do uh, stimulation uh, of a variety of different animal models, starting with, uh, with a rat. So here we have a rat in a cage. Uh, there's an antenna surrounding the outside of the cage, and we can power that with RF and, and do pacing at any kind of stimulation protocol you might, might imagine. And these are uh, ECG recordings uh, with and without pacing just to show the, the functionality. But we've done um, not only uh, rats, but rabbits and, uh, and humans as well, but not actual humans. It's actually explanted. Uh, uh, cardiac tissue from organ donors, but uh, but we can do that, and uh, and and it works even even at that even at that scale. So I, so I think it's an an important uh, area where where these ideas in material science might you know uh, offer the potential for impact. So I talked about pacemakers, intracranial mo uh, monitors, nerve stimulators, working on bone stimulators, There's different things you can do in antibacterials around thermal therapy, and we have programmable drug release vehicles as well. In all cases where you know this transient materials construction uh, you know offers key a key feature in the way that the devices operate. So with that, I think I'm out of time. I'm just going to you know conclude by uh, acknowledging the senior collaborators. So we're very collaborative in everything that we do, working with folks in engineering science. So that's clinical, medical interface that that's very important to us as well. And some of the folks that we're working with are uh, listed on this uh, slide. So th those folks are important to everything that we do, but uh, it's the students and the postdocs who actually do everything. So I always like to conclude by acknowledging their, uh, their efforts. I just get to talk about this stuff. They, they do all the work. So it's an amazing collection of postdocs and grad students, undergrads, lots of undergrads. All the kids with their hands raised are undergrads, so typically 30 or 40 uh, in, in the group at any given time. Really uh, great, great group of uh, people and fun, fun to work with. So, so with that, I'll just conclude. I'll be happy to answer questions if you have any.
scientists. Can you talk a little bit about the manufacturing techniques to produce some of these? Yeah, so it's kind of a, um, so the manufacturing approaches are kind of a blend of what's done in the semiconductor industry today uh, and some innovative approaches that you have to bring to bear on these materials because of their uh, water solubility. So a lot of the process steps that Intel would use to make an IC chip are, in, uh, are not applicable to these classes of materials because they dissolve away you know, during, during the process. So, so we like, um, I mentioned this kind of transfer process. There are several stages at which you know, the kind of a dry physical assembly approach like that uh, is kind of key in terms of how, how we put these things together. But in other cases, we're using uh, similar types of evaporation tools to deposit the metals. We're using uh, pretty well-established techniques to dope the silicon to control the, the doping levels and the, and the patterns of, of dopants. And in many cases, those steps can be done you know, before transfer to the transient substrate. So you eliminate some of the temperature constraints associated with the transient materials and the uh, inability to use you know, aqueous-based processing with those materials. So, so you showed one example where you could do it is basically a, a large-scale, large-volume are yeah. all these techniques you're talking about ones that would work for mass production? We think so. So we've spent a lot of time um, asking a question, what would I need to modify from a, a foundry-based fab facility to allow the production of transient electronics? So if you think about silicon fab, let's say an SOI-based fab, so silicon on insulation. So there's already very thin silicon on an insulating layer of SiO2 supported by a silicon wafer. Like, how, how can, what would I need to do to modify a fab that processes those kinds of wafers to yield a purely transient device? And so we've worked with Lincoln Lab. They have a 90 nanometer facility. We were funded by DARPA uh, a few years ago to, um, to prove out material substitution. So you get rid of copper, you replace it with tungsten. They're already using tungsten plugs. The silicon itself is transient. The SiO2 is transient. They are already using silicon nitride for different dielectric layers. We've shown that that's transient. So then if you replace, if you do the aluminum or copper replacement with uh, tungsten, then essentially you just need to get rid of the underlying handle wafer. And you end up with a very thin uh, integrated circuit where all the different components are water soluble. So that gets you to the IC component. Then you have to have uh, a transient equivalent of a printed circuit board platform so that you can take those IC components and assemble them together with passives with the right routing. Uh, you know, traces to, to build, build a system. And that's where these kind of conductive pastes come in because we can do antennas, thick traces, uh, interconnects, and so on. So, uh, so that's the way we kind of piece it together was try to take what is done today and modify it rather than try to, try to reinvent everything. And, um, you know, I think that kind of transfer process is pretty key, you know, in terms of uh, moving these foundry produced um, transient integrated circuits onto a you know, PCB platform that's made out of transient materials. So it's not a super crisp answer to your question because it really depends on all, all of the details, but that's kind of the flavor of it. Yeah. Well, you present a, pretty, a lot of lab ideas. So what, how practically useful with this technology? What's the market in the future? Yeah, I think it's a great, great, great question. So we've been, um, having those discussions with our clinical collaborators uh, right now. The question is like, how do you stage out you know, technologies that would allow you to generate you know, a revenue stream in the relatively near term while you build out you know, additional application areas? Like how do you do that? And how you think about the regulatory process? Because I don't think the FDA has ever had to deal with transient like biodegradable electronics. So that's a whole kind of uh, unknown, I guess, in terms of how you move. There's one argument that would say it's going to be easier to get FDA approval for these type of implants compared to a pacemaker because the devices are only there for a finite amount of time and they're eventually uh, dis disappearing by you know, hydrolysis or enzymatic degradation. But then the flip side of that is they've never looked at this before. And then the other problem is these systems don't typically dissolve in a completely deterministic way where things just get thinner and thinner and thinner and disappear. Typically they will fragment at some point and they'll fracture into small pieces. And then where do those pieces go? Because if those pieces ever enter the bloodstream, 
it could be a big problem because it uh, could, could represent blockage, right, of, of blood flow. Even if that's transient, if it's even for a few minutes, it could be a big problem and cause a stroke or something like that. So we've tried to stay outside of any uh, blood flow path. We haven't done anything in the intra, uh, 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 inter, intracardial space, uh, endocardial space, or anything in, in the blood vessels. So, so it's, it's a direction that we, we want to go. I mean, that's kind of the whole purpose of what we're doing, is to build devices that could actually be used with, with humans. But it's, it's non-trivial. So, so we're, we're thinking it through and, and trying to identify opportunities that are large enough markets that would allow you to get, get a business started, but at the same time, near term enough that that you can that you could get there right in in, in a few few years so so i think it's, it's still a topic of uh, discussion we put together a company a few few years ago but then decided it was a little bit too early <laughs> so we'd like to have things a little bit more solidified we're able to sort of push the technology along in, in in the academic lab but i would say over the next two three years i hope that we can get into a position that we can start moving things into a commercial space so i think it's a great question something we're thinking about a lot yeah. Yeah. So, it, <clears throat> admittedly, I know nothing about immune response. Has there been any rejection of these foreign bodies in anything you've seen, even though they are biodegradable? Yeah, that's a great question. So, if you think about immune response and rejection and inflammation, is driven by type two consider two main considerations. One would be uh, just the underlying chemistry of the materials themselves and the products of their dissolution, so sort of a chemistry question. The other one is, uh, you know, even if you have a material that's biocompatible, you know, at the chemistry level, if it's mechanically interfaced to the, to the body in a way that creates mechanical uh, stresses and, uh, you know, ir irritation, that can be a separate problem, right? So the, the second one, I guess both of them to some extent are highly dependent on the use case, the nature of the device, the place in the body where the devices are located. But I would say, um, I wouldn't say that there's no chance of problem in any kind of scenario, but I can say that we have never observed an issue with, with inflammation. We've, we've done you know, detailed studies of um, you know, immune, immune response, both at the level of cell-based assays and small animals primarily, um, intracranial, cardiac surface, nerve interface, just general subdermal. We've, we've looked at all of those locations, but you know, and chemistry is different at different places in the body. You, you could, there, there could be some unexpected effects due to position or due to the details of the, how the devices have been built. But for the, for the applications that I described, we've looked at those kinds of uh, questions very carefully and haven't, haven't seen anything that, that's problematic. But I think it needs to be case-by-case -case basis because a lot of the biological responses are not well understood. So you, you can't really predict it. You have to go into animals and see, see what happens. Yeah. So uh, it seems that most of the circuits were implanted by means of surgery, but I was wondering if we can do, uh, apply those circuits to other organs without surgery. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think, as you highlighted, most of the applications we're talking about, you have open access to the body as a natural consequence of a surgical procedure that needs to happen anyway. So we're not opening up a patient strictly for the purpose of inserting one of these transient devices. Patients already open, right? And you're just leaving a device behind just before they're closed up. So the, the question that you're asking is, would it be possible to deploy these devices in use case scenarios that don't involve a natural access point, right, um, uh, as part of the standard of care? And I don't know the answer to that question. We've thought about it. Like if you could create some kind of, um, you know, device that could be d deployable, so it could be folded up into a tiny, you know, geometry and maybe injected with a syringe, and then once it's in the body, it un unfurls in some way. So I think there's some really cool concepts that probably need to be um, thought about in the context of materials and mechanical, you know, actuation strategies and so on. So we've thought about it. I think especially in the context of brain interface, if you could just do a very tiny burr hole and then uh, you know, insert a, dev uh, a device in that way. Um, but again, for these, it's, it's severe traumatic brain injuries. This is not just getting knocked on the head on a football field. This is something like car crash or something like that. Your, your head is split open at some level anyway, and so you're, you're, you're opening up that, that intracranial space. Or even the um, procedures used to treat epilepsy, the whole cap of the skull is removed, so the brain is exposed and you get devices on there. But, but I think like highly, like minimally invasive approaches to deployment, that, that's a great area to think about. And I, we don't have the, uh, the answers, but we kind of thought about it. But 
if you have a great idea, that's that's a good space to <laughs> you know think about research opportunities. Yeah.